Hello and welcome to the Quagmire. Today, this is, um, I am Alan Marsh. Today, I'm hosting along with um, Laura Perrin. Say hello. And Hi, I'm Laura. And today, we are also, we also have a co-host, Rob. So, say hello, Rob. Hello. So, um, today, hello. today, we are interviewing, or more specifically, Rob is interviewing um, the great philosophy professor, Professor Lloyd Strickland, so introduce yourself. Hi, thanks, Aaron. Uh, I'm Lloyd Strickland. I'm Professor of Philosophy and Intellectual History here at Manchester Metropolitan. Yeah, so um, great to have you. Like, um, I know, Rob, like, you have a lot of questions for Lloyd, so far, far away. Yeah, right. So I've always been interested in different religious interpretations um, of God. But when we studied the introduction to the history of I mean, the introduction to the philosophy of religion last year, it was pretty Christocentric. And personally, that left me wanting a little bit more. And just wanted to ask you, Lloyd, when you wrote your course this year, obviously it's more inclusive. Was that the same sort of angle that you were coming from or were there other reasons? Uh, Oh, thanks, Rob. That's a nice question. Um, I think there were probably uh, three different things that went into my forming the course the way that it is first uh, sort of goes back a few years because um, much of my research is done in 17th, 18th century philosophy. So one of the things I was discovering was that all the histories of philosophy that were written back then, they would all talk about the religions of, you know, non-European peoples. So Arabic peoples, um, Chinese peoples and so on. And this was all treated as philosophy. And then all of a sudden, at the end of the 18th century, this stops dead. And all the histories of philosophy that get written just exclude everybody from outside of the West. So that got me really intrigued by it. We know what happened. And, you know, it's a pretty sad answer in the end. It's, you know, the development of scientific racism. Um, different peoples across the world were grouped into different races, all color-coded, and abilities were tied to this as well. So, you know, the whites were seen as the, the group that had reason, so they were the ones that could do philosophy, so it stood to reason that everybody else wasn't doing it. And so all of these other groups from outside Europe were suddenly excluded from philosophy, and it's been that way for hundreds and hundreds of years. So that's, that's a horrific thing to discover. Uh, you know, if you're unwittingly helping that along, as it were, by just talking about the sort of Western or European stuff, not realising what the history was, so that, that was one of the reasons that got me into doing the course the way that I did. Uh, the second is the decolonization of the curriculum movement, which you'll all be aware of. Uh, that's yeah. become very vocal in recent years, and I entirely support that. And the third was having some African friends who would ask me questions like, why, why isn't there African philosophy ever? Right. In, yeah, exactly. In, in philosophy courses, you know, if you are doing non-Western, you will get some Chinese maybe or some Indian philosophies, but there's loads of books on those. Yeah. There's not so much on African philosophy. So it just made me think, right, I, I really want to start doing something like this. So yeah. if you look around, you can actually find some pretty good materials on it, but it does, it does take a bit of looking. So all of those things yeah. combined just sort of led me to do the course the way that I did. Right. Well, there's, there's a couple of things there. I mean, just on the, the African philosophy, I mean, personally, even from looking at other philosophies of religion, I had never come across any African philosophy. So having you put that in the curriculum, I mean, is already very helpful because you talk about the Shauna and the, um, the, yeah. Mark, I can't, yeah, can't. Say, the I can't. Mark, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but the last thing I wanted to, or the, the, the first thing that you said about the, um, the scientific racism. I wondered if you could expand on that because I remember you wrote an article about it um, and you name dropped a certain philosopher uh, who was pretty much to blame for it. Could, could you just talk about that a little bit more about what he did? And, you, know, uh, you, you want me to say can, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's sometimes thought that, you know, Europe has always been a very racist place, you know, up until mm. very recently, and some would argue it still is, and, you know, argument it is. Yeah. Um, but that, that's not true, you know. Racism as an idea is something that was developed from yeah. basically nothing. The idea that we split the peoples of the world into races, divided into colours, was new. Prior to that, yeah. people were just dividing the folks of the world up geographically. Yeah. So you'd, you'd have yeah. Europeans, you'd have 
Indians, you'd have, but the, it wasn't necessarily attached to abilities. And sure, there was a lot of, um, you know, some groups would think less of other groups. There was some of that going on. But the way that it became, a, a, you know, a scientific theory almost, uh, Kant was right at the heart of that. Um, mm. sad to say in his anthropological writings. Um, and the ideas that he developed in those, unfortunately, he pursued in his philosophical writings as well. So when he came to look at the history of philosophy, he excluded everything from outside of, you know, Europe, from white yeah. European. And he just described it as child's play, or he described it as not philosophy at all. And those who followed him, and that was a lot of folks in Europe at the time, they followed him in that too, unfortunately. And uh, so even though I like to think scientific racism is long gone, the effects of it on philosophy as a discipline are still with us, and we're still struggling to get rid of all that. Yeah, and I mean, it's just such a shame because yeah. you've got all of these different philosophies which really do tackle su such a wide variety of things, whereas Western philosophy is generally, I'm using the word generally, more... Um, more about reason and logic and things like that um and that leads me on to our next point kind of which is you know it's important to look at the different philosophies not just for their outlooks in life but specifically in terms of philosophy of religion um i guess i would want to ask you why do you personally think it's important to look at the different notions of god and not just the christocentric notion of god I think part of the reason is because once you look at other conceptions of God, you start to see solutions to problems that uh -huh. otherwise look very difficult when you're just working with the standard God of the philosophers. Yeah. God of the philosophers is this omnipotent, omniscient, perfectly good, mm -hmm. eternal, timeless, you know, spiritual being and so on. And, you know, yeah. folks have pointed out all, all manner of different problems with that over the years. Um, but also with the, the, the Christian God, obviously, has been associated with being masculine. Now, yep. whether that's exactly what folks wanted at the time, I'm not sure. But um, certainly there's plenty of images. Michelangelo's creation of Adam is the obvious one. God and Adam, mm -hmm. their fingers touching. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it gives the impression that, you know, we are supposed to be made in God's image. And God is this old white man. Well, that's not very inclusive, is it? You know, yeah. if, if you're not old and white and, and, and male, it doesn't look as if you're really made in God's image at all. Um, whereas other conceptions of God don't have that problem. And certainly the African conceptions of God, I mean, they're, they're different conceptions. Um, you can't depict God for a start, so you can't depict God as having any color. Mm -hmm. The idea of God as entirely genderless is very, very common in Africa, and certainly in the Shona religion. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's wonderful because this is something that, you know, in the West, people have been wrestling with for a long time now. How do you think of God when God is a spiritual being, so presumably doesn't have a gender, and yet we continually call God him, her, exactly. his kids, and so on. And we call God father and so on. So the Sean of God doesn't have that problem. Exactly. I, I wondered if... Um... Just if you could elaborate a little bit, you said how it helps solve the problems. And when you when you talk about the gender on your course, you say how in like the Shauna religions and even in Islam um, to and other religions to a lesser extent, the uh, is it called uh, the proper nouns or something aren't actually gendered. And then you looked at how the only reason the Christian God is referred to as if he is because we don't have a genderless noun. And so that kind of, so, that could help solve a problem that we've been wrestling with, which is the gender of God. I just wondered if you could elaborate on that a little bit, please. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah, English is quite funny in the way that it's structured. So yeah. our nouns are not gendered, right? We don't yeah. classify nouns in the masculine, feminine, or neuter. We used to, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, but now we yeah. don't. Nouns are neuter. But our pronouns are not. Our pronouns are gendered. So we use him, her. Mm -hmm. You know, he, she, and it are the main sort of uh, pronouns that we use. He, we tend to use for masculine things, she for feminine things, and it for, you know, things. Yeah. Things that aren't persons, shall we say. So if you're coming to discuss God, um, what pronoun do you use? Yeah. This is the problem. So in English, uh, we, we don't have the idea of a, a masculine pronoun. In Arabic, they do. 
So in yeah. Arabic, uh, the word Allah is an unreal masculine pronoun. Unreal, not in the sense that God is real, but in the sense that it's referring to something that isn't actually masculine. Yeah. So grammatically speaking, Allah is masculine. So you would use the masculine pronouns, but that doesn't mean you're saying that Allah is masculine. Yeah. So it gets around the problem. In English, we don't have that answer. So we've got to choose from he, she, or it. And they all yeah. have their problems. He yeah, exactly. implies masculine, she implies feminine, and it implies not a person at all. So what do we use? Well, I, I, when I watched your gender um, thing, I, I wondered what, 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 what's, what the big issue was with it. I don't know why we have to conceive as God as a person, per se. I mean, I understand that we were created in his image, supposedly, but I, I, don't, I don't know why it has to be such a bad thing for God to be an it. I don't know. I don't know. Just wondered. <laughs> I think most folks don't like it because we tend to use it for objects things yeah. rather than yeah. persons, whereas God is usually thought to be a person, mm. um, obviously not quite in the same way that we are, but so much more so than we are. Um, it's yeah. someone with whom one can have a relationship, whereas one couldn't arguably have a relationship with a, you know, a thing. Well, maybe you could, but, but I think the element of keeping God as a person is very, very important to many religions. And so, that sort of disqualifies the it pronoun. Yeah, yeah, and I guess. We're left with he and she, and then, oh dear, we've got, we've got to choose between a gender at that point. And uh, so some philosophers have suggested we just introduce a whole new pronoun, Z. So it's X, Z, yeah. Z. Yeah, that's... Um, it's a new idea, you know, whether it will take off, I don't know. But other languages just don't have this problem. You know, it, it seems to be a problem that's very prevalent in English that just you just don't find in other languages. So why why do you think that is, Lloyd, that we, we anthropomorphize God? Why we anthropomorphize God? Mm -hmm. um, this seems to be something of a Western issue, doesn't it? Um, certainly with the depiction of God. Um, I mean, the problem becomes when you start to depict God. Right. So African religions don't have any they don't forbid anybody from trying to depict God. But it's just a general sense of, well, why would you? God's just not the kind of thing you can depict, depict. Whereas in the West, some folks have decided that it would actually be possible to do it and, or desirable to do it. And so they've done it in such a way where obviously God comes out as an old white man, which is extremely unfortunate for reasons we've already seen. Um. But why we would want to anthropomorphize God, I don't know, because, well, it, I suppose it doesn't help that in some of the, the spiritual texts, you, you do come across descriptions of God in anthropomorphic terms. So you'll have references to God's face, God's hands, things like that. And certainly for, say, early Christians, they took that literally. They thought God was a physical being like us, but just bigger than us. And there are descriptions in the Bible of God you know, as a man. So that lends itself to being depicted in a certain way. And of course, later, and with a bit more thinking and a bit more theology, people decide, no, God must be a spiritual being. But at that point, they're still trying to depict God pictorially. And then you get the problems associated with that, because if you're obviously depicting God uh, as a man, that's problematic. Yeah, yeah. Um Okay, so, okay, so before we get back to Rob and stuff, I've got a question. So, um, you're, even if we use the notion of God as a being, most people portray him as a white man. Surely, wouldn't it be better to portray God as, like, you know, if he is a being, or God, they are a being, like, can we portray God as, like, completely gender fluid, or even, like, intersex, like, shouldn't we... I'm not even trying to sound like woke here, but I'm just saying that it just makes more sense to portray God as someone who has all sexualities, and all genders, like all sexes, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, well, mm. it's an interesting question because, of course, certainly um, the major branches of Christianity over the last few decades have all tried to make the statement that God is without gender. Mm -hmm. And yeah. being a spirit, you'd think, 
gender just simply wouldn't apply, so that makes perfect sense. But of course, Christianity is saddled with this sort of long history of uh, associating God with masculinity through like, titles such as Father, you've got Jesus Christ, clearly uh, uh, is, is male, and obviously, obviously the pronouns, him, he, and so on. So Christianity is trying to conceive God in a genderless way. Other religions do it that much more effortlessly because they don't have that, that history of doing it. But the Shona God is interesting because you get people conceiving that in different ways. So a lot of people conceive it as entirely genderless. Others conceive it as masculine and feminine combined. And that, that's not unusual in Africa. There's, uh, there's other religions in Africa that also um, conceive God in those terms. And those that do conceive God as masculine and feminine do so because there are masculine and feminine traits associated with God. So um, the fact that God is like Lord of the skies in the Shona religion, that's seen as a masculine trait. But God is also a God of fertility, which is seen as a feminine trait. So if you've got masculine and feminine traits, to some Shona people, it makes sense to conceive God, Mwari, as masculine and feminine rather than simply genderless. So there are multiple ways of, of conceiving of God. So you're absolutely right. You know, there's no reason why you, you can't conceive God in these different ways. Um, then we should hand it back to Rob because, I mean, this is like your interview kind of. So and I don't want to take over, like, take over the interview. So I do think, Rob, do you have okay. any more questions? I think we might have lost Rob again. Rob is having trouble with his connection. So maybe um, I will ask a question. And while Rob, are you there? I'll ask um, I was muted. No, I was speaking, but I was muted myself. Uh, <laughs> Rob. And the um, the 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 idea of the Horis and what it led me to a question was was why it's so important to look at other religions when you're looking at philosophy of religion because a lot of people have this idea in Islam about um and jihadists especially, about when you die, you get 72 virgins. And you looking at the idea of the Hori really sort of clears that up and and also provides some interesting insights, like as to um, the afterlives in all religions, how they do kind of cater to primal desires. So I guess there's two things there. It's like, um, it's interesting to look at other religions to clear things up and also to gain interesting perspectives. Yeah. Um, what do you think? <laughs> well, the, the, reason, uh, the, the reason that I decided I was going to do a segment on the hurries uh, was because I thought it'd be kind of cool to get the idea of sex in the afterlife in there. Yeah. Right? It's, yeah. it's not a topic that's covered very often, let's be honest. So I thought, yeah, that would be a really interesting topic to cover, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, and it was just a natural... Thing to do because you, you've got these references in the Quran to these paradise companions, um, the Huris, and it's incorrectly translated as virgins. You know, although I think it's fairly clear from how they describe that they're actually intended as virgins, that's not their defining feature, right? It's their eyes that are defining feature, yeah. right? So very, very beautiful, pure creatures with very black eyes, yeah, and very, yeah, yeah, and so on. Um, but yes, they are said to be uh, the rewards for male believers, or at least in, in the first years in which the Quran is being written, they are said to be that. In the later years, they drop out completely. And your, your yeah. companion in paradise is said to be your partner and, and your family and so on. Yeah. But still, there's this huge tradition that comes up around it, and that's where the idea of getting these 72 virgins in paradise comes from. So... Um, in, with, with the Quran, obviously that's the sacred text of Islam, but you've also got the hadiths, which are the sayings and the doings of the Prophet Muhammad, which have been sort of recorded by many different people and they got collected hundreds of years later. And the hadiths contain lots of different statements about the Huris that you simply don't find in the Quran. Um, one of which is, if you're, if you're martyred in the cause of Islam, you will get 72 virgins in paradise or 72 Huris in paradise. And that one is actually graded as authentic good, which is a strange grading. Um, mostly they're graded either authentic 
good or weak. This one is somehow graded authentic good. Uh, so folks have actually scratched their heads for a while thinking, what does that mean? But generally mm. it's thought to be fairly reliable. So the idea is there in the Hadiths. Um, now, whether that really actually supports jihadists in what they do, I very much doubt, uh, because the, the Quran also says plenty about you know, not killing people. Yeah, sort of exactly. thing. So, But also, one of the things I found very interesting with the topic is that although there's been this long tradition of, of conceiving these hurries in very lurid ways, and there's all these terrible details about how long sex lasts with a hurry and yeah. um, how much power <laughs> men have in the afterlife. They have a power of a hundred men and something like that. Mm. Um, bottom line is, you know, there's, there's also a long strand of thought which conceives all this in spiritual terms. That what, yeah. The afterlife is supposed to be a spiritual thing, but obviously mm. we can't conceive of that. And so what we have to do is cast around for sort of earthly pleasures that somehow in some tiny little way might approximate what these spiritual pleasures would be like. And if the spiritual pleasure is union with God, uh, some say maybe it's sexual union that gives us the best possible way of understanding what that's like. So the idea of, of huris could actually be seen as symbolic rather than real, which is uh, a, yeah. a sobering thought for those who are actually hoping to meet them in the afterlife. And actually, there's another interesting um, quirk on this. Don't well, worry. I found that a very interesting yeah. point. Yeah, did, did you also know about 20 years ago, I think it was, some scholar said, actually, no, it probably doesn't refer to females at all. It probably refers to grapes. So uh, we're rewarded with 72 grapes because apparently grapes were very uh, highly prized in the desert where the Quran was <laughs> <laughs> That great stuff. Okay. <laughs> so I love the idea, but how, how valid it is, I don't know. Yeah, we love those juicy grapes. Um, Rob, are you all right? Have you got internet? Yeah. <laughs> um, I found that. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. You just broke up for a while. Sorry, um, I did. I did find that a very interesting point that he said, Lloyd, about um, about how the afterlife is meant to be a spiritual place. It's meant to be talking about uh, afterlife um, and things like that, and. I wondered, I mean, you talked about how the Horis could be really talking about a union with God, but how could the other ones be perceived as spiritual, like how the, the promise of food and drink, or in Christianity, in cities of gold and things like that? How can that be, I'm just wondering, how can that be perceived spiritually? Uh, the quick answer is probably that it can't. <laughs> okay, it's, uh, you know... There are different ways of conceiving the afterlife, you know, um, so some people conceive it entirely spiritual terms. So we lose the body, we cast that aside and we're just, you know, some kind of spirit or soul. Mm. Um, so there'd be none of the pleasures mm. of the body, none of the experiences that we're familiar with today. Uh, so that's a very spiritual way of yeah. trying to conceive the afterlife. But also we can't really get our heads around it because it's just so completely unlike anything that we ever experienced. How on earth would yeah. we know what that's like? So, and you have other people conceiving the afterlife in much more physical terms. So where it is a life of luxury, you've got palaces and rivers and um, all the things you could yeah. ever want to eat and drink and so on. And that's, you know, another way of conceiving it. But some will argue that that really is just the only way to try and get the idea across to us of how wonderful it's going to be. Because we can't conceive of anything more spiritual because yeah. you know we're rooted in our senses and our bodies and that kind of thing and that's how we interact with the world you know when we can't conceive of anything else so it's quite possible that they're not intended to be taken literally you know different ways of interpreting these things mm. yeah. I've got a question now I've yeah got a question about, um, um, and that oh god so um because couldn't you argue maybe one reason for framing it in the spiritual manner like one reason is because at the end of the day a an organized religion is trying to sell you something it's trying to sell you 
their religion and as a consequence putting, th- putting their afterlife into terms that people can understand is the way of selling stuff if you get what I'm saying so you could argue that I won't call it a business per se but as like an institution it makes more sense to describe the afterlife in these physical terms uh, Aaron I completely agree with that yeah uh, and of course, there, there's an argument that that's what happened in the early years of the uh, the formation of the Quran, because at the time, Islam is a you know, it's a nascent religion, doesn't have many followers. If it's going to survive at all, it's got to get support from big, powerful leaders, which of course are men. And men at the time, they've got slave girls; they can have sex with slave girls, for example. Um, so how do you appeal to people like that who've got all the earthly things they want? You just promise them more of the same, I guess. And that's the thinking, is that that's why you get these furries mentioned. It's a way of yes. attracting people into the religion. But otherwise, why not care one way or the other? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it, it, it could absolutely be that. What are the benefits to looking at different religious motifs and metaphors uh, for us culturally now, is there a place for religious motifs in our current world or society? Well, to, to answer that last question first, uh, absolutely yes. I mean, um, let, let's be honest, the world is still a very, very religious place. It might not mm. seem to us sometimes in the secular West, but um, Current estimates are about 90% of the population or 95% of the world's population believe in some kind of supreme being. And that figure I get from an atheist sociology of religion, sociologist of religion. So, um, you know, religious belief is far more pervasive in the world than it might actually seem to us. We're actually in the UK fairly out of step with the rest of the world on this. So absolutely. Mm. Yeah. And I think, one of the benefits of being able to look at different religious beliefs is it just makes it easier for, for us to actually understand the way other folks think around the world. Um, because it's very easy to take what we believe in the West as somehow the best view or the only view or the view that other people should be looking up to. Whereas I'm not convinced that's really the way we should be thinking. And it's better just to understand that Different people have different ideas, they have different beliefs, and we should seek to understand them rather than simply impose our own views on them. Obviously, the West has gone into huge problems with that in the past, with colonialism and so on. Um, And of course, it can be done intellectually as well. And I think sometimes in the West, we are uh, quite guilty of thinking that our way of viewing the world is actually the best way or even the only way, whereas really, it's just one of the ways in which we can. So... um, a little bit of a mutual understanding of the ideas of people in the world, I think, is a, is a good thing. Plus, of course, this stuff is very interesting. You know, coming at these ideas from different, from different angles and different perspectives, I think, is just a great way of broadening the mind, you know, broadening one's horizons. So, you know, that, yeah. if it had no other benefit, I think that would be reasonable. To do. But, of course, it does have other benefits, too. Rob, are you there? Are you still with us? Um, What's it like there, Rob? Can you describe it? <laughs> can you hear me, Rob? Speak to me from the other world. Um, so maybe I can ask one of my questions then, Lloyd, if you don't mind, while we, while we wait for Rob. Um, so you described yourself as a friendly agnostic. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I, I just think <laughs> there is such a major delay, Rob. Rob, Rob the audio is coming out of my toaster. This is weird now. <laughs> oh, ble- oh, he's gone. Rob's oh. gone. Um, he's finally entered the shadow realm. He's finally yeah, entered the afterlife. Yeah, yeah. He's communicating. Oh, like with the others all right people um, yes, yes, yeah. RIP, RIP. um okay so my my question um lloyd you describe yourself as a friendly agnostic um and it says that you take religious ideas very seriously why do you take religious ideas very seriously uh i i, I think for the most part i, I don't like to be dismissive of of anything 
Mm-hmm. The fact that somebody holds a different view from mine, I don't consider to be reason enough to be dismissive of it. Sure. And of course, you know, religious ideas especially, um, they've got such wide currency around the world. Um, you know, they're, they're treasured beliefs. They're, they're precious beliefs for many people. So again, sort of treading on those, I think is, is not a good tactic as a general rule. Yeah. And... Um, You know, I'm in no position to actually say what is right and what is wrong when it comes to these things. So I think for that reason alone, you know, a sheer element of respect is is a good idea for approaching these ideas. So I think that's at the heart of why I call myself a friendly agnostic. So I hope that that helps to answer that. Great. Yeah, it it, it does. Um, And uh, another question. I don't know if you've... uh... If you thought of uh, of a good answer to this, um, so what is your favourite definition of God? No, I haven't. You haven't? No. Well, now's the time. No. I, I've I've got to say, different conceptions of God have got different things going for them. So, um, I mean, obviously, the God of the philosophers. I mean, you're talking about very much the ultimate supreme being there, aren't you? And I can, I can see the attraction of that. But at the same time, um, and this has come up in teaching, say, the Shana conception of God. Uh, some of the students have made this point. It's, it's a conception of God to which we can relate that much more easily. Right? So the Shana God isn't human. No, it's well beyond human. But it's not described in such extreme terms. So there's no description of, of God as omnipotent or omniscient just powerful and wise. And and we can relate to that much more easily, I think. Uh, Plus Mm. it helps to understand some of the the issues that we've got with the world. So the Shona God, it's it's widely believed that the Shona God created everything good and evil, right? Whereas in in some religions, certainly with the God of the philosophers and the way it's discussed in, in texts and so on, you often get the impression that it's a complete and a mystery how the world went bad. When you've got a God that powerful and that wise and that good at the helm of it all, how on earth does it all go wrong? Yeah. And it can get into all sorts of problems with that, whereas I think in the Shona religion, you don't. Of course, the side effect of that is you, you seem to be working with a, a, an attenuated conception of God. So not omnipotent, but powerful. Not omniscient, but wise. So you've got to deal with that. But certainly it's much more relatable. And for that reason, I quite like that too. And of course, you've got the sort of gender neutrality built in, which solves problems too. So I'm not sure I've got a favorite conception of God, but um, I do like the way the Shauna conceive of the God, I have to say. Yeah. Okay, great. It's very interesting. Uh, Can you guys hear me? Am I I audible? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, cool. Um, I just had one little question. It's kind of related. It's more of a sidetrack, but I can't remember who said it. But someone said something like, "When, uh, uh, when a society or a culture comes up with a god, what they're really doing is sort of holding up a mirror, and what is reflected back is, from their psyches is their conception of a god." So the old Christian god of the Old Testament was very dominator kind of the same with Allah and then the Shauna and and the Akan are quite different and even Asian gods are quite different Um, I find it very then interesting to see the philosophers how what they wanted to hold up was this rational being who was so logical and rational but that's kind of just what they wanted really (laughs) you know like and I guess my point is we, we should be looking at um, all of at different religions because we sh- we should be looking at our cultural differences. What because what the differences that come up in the mirror and we can understand each other better in a sense. And I'm sure you agree. And I hope you can say sort of what you think about it. <laughs> yeah, uh, I absolutely do agree. Um, yeah, you'll get different conceptions of God based on different cultural practices and also on different cultural needs as well. Um, but certainly the God of the philosophers just, just leaps out as a bit of an oddity. It, it feels like a, an artificial creation at times in that if you look at the sacred texts from around the world or the different praise names of the different gods and so on, 
you simply don't find anything that comes close to the God of the philosophers, which makes you wonder why we're discussing it in such depth and why yeah. it's exercised the mind of so many people. But I suppose it's good to bear in mind that philosophers are a very, very tiny proportion of the overall population, both today mm. and in the past. So um, perhaps we ought not to be putting too much weight on the conception of the God that's been built up there. And which is why mm. I think in the course what I'm trying to do is go back and look at what's actually yeah. written in the sacred text. What exactly are, you know, what do the Africans call their God? That's how mm. we get to the understanding of what, um, how God is conceived. And I think that's actually quite revealing because you realize the distance between uh, the conception of God that the philosophers have been working with for so long mm. and the conceptions of God that are actually found in these sacred writings and in the, um, in the African religions, through the praise names, for example, it's a big distance. Mm. Yeah, and then on on the other side of that, I mean, the, there's the side of the values of looking at the other religions, and then I also think there's value at looking at why the philosophers probably wanted to give God the attributes they then gave the God, God, and. In my mind, the way I see it, it's kind of so that their theories would work. And I'm kind of looking at Descartes when I mean this. Like, he was, he, he wanted God to have certain properties so that he could then say other things. And I wonder if you think he's guilty of that. And not just Descartes, but other people too. And, and what are the effects of their guiltiness? <laughs> <laughs> well... With Descartes especially, I mean, we shouldn't pin too much blame on him for that because the god of the philosophers that he was working with uh, had been established long before he came about. So he played no real part in, in developing that. It had right. been so long established by the time he came around. It, it was just the way that mm. intellectually orientated people would conceive of God. So it's no surprise that he would try and orientate his philosophy around that because yeah. that's what you have to work with. You know, if, if you yeah. believe in a lot of the philosophers and the rest of your philosophy has to fit around that. So yeah, absolutely. He does make his philosophy fit to it. Um, and he, he gets a lot of mileage out of that conception of God as well. So oh, yeah. he can tell you that the laws of nature will never change. Why? Because God never changes. You can infer yeah. from the fact that, God never changes, that the laws of nature that God creates will never change. That's great. You know, so he can get some interesting ideas out of it. Um, yeah, that's that a very interesting say. point to, to interject just quickly. That, that the laws of nature, that's such an interesting one because that was kind of established by Descartes. And the effects of that are quite profound because now in science, it's kind of a dogma that there are eternal laws of nature. And that's just sort of lasting from what Descartes posited. And unfortunately, the laws of nature aren't actually fixed. Like even the, the supposed constants like gravity and, you know, big G, capital G and the speed of light. They aren't constant. They actually change at different times and different uh, places in space and the notion that they are constant is sort of a remnant of you know cartesian laws of laws of nature i wondered what other effects there are of conceiving of essentially of conceiving of god in certain ways how they still affect us today now well i'm not sure that say the way scientists conceive of the laws of nature as, as fixed is a holdover from that. I think it's just a basic assumption that's often made. Um, right. You certainly wouldn't work on the assumption that the laws of nature are going to change five minutes down the line. Um, yeah, exactly. You just assume that they're going to stay the same until evidence tells you that they don't. Um, so certainly with the speed of light, yes, we know there's variation in that, uh, depending on gravity and so on. And some of the physical constants that you alluded to, I think some of those perhaps aren't quite so constant as folks originally thought but as a starting assumption i think it makes a certain degree of sense to say well let's assume that these things will always be like this and you know if they're not well let the evidence tell us otherwise mm. yeah um Aaron, no, i guess wanted to say something sorry i've got um i've got a question on these notions of god so um 
<clears throat> okay, couldn't you argue that um, confusing the Christian the Christian notion of God with the philosopher's notion of God? Couldn't you argue that led to a lot of like inconsistencies within the Bible? Like before, I used to confuse like the two, and I thought the Christian God was like omnipotent, omniscient, like omnibenevolent, like. But when you look at God's feet within the Bible. I mean, taking seven days to create the earth, purely an almighty being makes more sense than an all-powerful being. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely right, yeah. It's, it's really interesting when you do go back to these uh, original sacred texts, and certainly even the first line of the Bible, everyone thinks it says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, but those with a better knowledge of Hebrew actually make the point that, uh, no, it doesn't say that at all. You know, it, it, the, you know, the translation we're so used to kind of suggests that the universe is popping into existence out of nothing, which then makes you wonder why it takes so long for God to get it into the state <laughs> desired. But in a more careful translation, and I've looked at multiple different Hebrew translations of this, uh, it's making the point that the earth, the formless waste, was already there when God starts the creative activity. And then maybe then you can start to understand why it might take so long. God simply doesn't have the power to pop it into existence fully formed in the way that, you know, desired. It takes time to actually get it the way it's wanted. So, so you get, again, you have a big discrepancy mm-hmm. between the way that philosophers have understood this and talked about this mm-hmm. for such a long time and what the texts actually say. And I think that's mm-hmm. really, really interesting and very important too. I was about to say that he makes God seem in comparison to like other like, you know, I wouldn't say fictional characters and stuff, but in comparison to like, you know, other like characters in different media, he seems pretty weak. Like he actually seems like a pretty weak character. Like, yeah. Well, like, the other the other option is though, if you say, if you read the start of say the book of Genesis saying that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, um he seems what, what seems to happen is that what's created is a formless waste which God then has to work on. So it's like a two step creation. Yeah. But if you've got that absolute power, why not just pop things into existence in mm. the way you want them, just like that? You know, if you had the ability to create a house from nothing, presumably you would just create a pile of bricks on the floor and timbers and things like that and then put them together. Presumably, you just magically make them appear in the form that you want from the outset, right? Mm-hmm. So it seems odd that that initial translation that we're, we're so used to in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, because it, it just, as some people make the point, it makes God look incompetent. That what's created mm-hmm. is just a mess which then has to be sorted out later. Yes. Why not just, create, if, you know, if the power's there, why not just create it right, perfect, right from the very start? Who knows? Maybe, mm. maybe he was the greatest procrastinator. Maybe he was one. Yeah. Maybe he was a procrastinator. So that could be a take. Yeah, that's right. One of the things that's quite interesting looking at lots of these different religions is that many of them don't see God as creator in that sense of bringing everything into existence. They see God as creator in the sense of organizing what's already there. Mm. So. The universe is something that exists alongside God. God doesn't bring it into existence, but God can shape it. Mm. So there's still a lot of power there. You know, we obviously can't do that. It's well beyond what we can do. But um, it's mm. not omnipotence as we've been sold it by the God of the philosophers. It's something quite different from that. And it's interesting mm. in that you find this across many religions and even in Christianity and Judaism and Islam, you will find it very difficult to find any idea of creation from nothing from the sacred text. It's just not really there. Yeah. Good, Rob, I find that you... so interesting. Oh, sorry. Don't be. No, I just find that so interesting um, that because uh, I've, I've not heard much about that but just thinking about that is interesting the fact that or the notion that um god is not as necessarily a creator but more as a manipulation of stuff that's already there because that speaks to uh human potential because we don't create stuff but we can manipulate stuff that's already there 
I think that's just very interesting. Even from you just saying that then, um, that kind of connects us more to the divine in that sense because we kind of have that divine power. We manipulate things. And I don't know. I, I just think that was very interesting. Um, yeah, quite yeah. cool. And you find this in, with the African gods as well. The idea mm. of creation from nothing is, is, is just not there. Mm. Uh, though what has happened is obviously the idea is infiltrated from um, Europeans going over there and colonization and so on. Um, so you will find now in some African religions the idea of creation from nothing, but it wasn't originally part of the religion. Um, but otherwise, God is just seen as a, an organizer, mm. like, rather than a, a creator. From And that's exactly right. I mean, that's exactly how we create. We create a dress. Yeah, we We're not creating it out of nothing. We've yeah. got more materials we have to work with. Um, mm. And so why, why shouldn't it be the same? Well, big questions. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what philosophy is all about, right? The big questions. Damn right. Exactly, exactly. That's why we're all here, right? So, I mean, I think if we don't have any more questions for Lloyd, Aram, uh, Rob, I think um, we say, oh, go on, Rob. Okay. No, we're okay. We're okay. <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to say thank you very much for your time, Lloyd. And um, very yes, much. I mean, yeah, it's been it's been fun. Thank you for having me. It's been yeah. a pleasure, honestly. Like, I've lo- I've just loved discussion. I like, discussing with you, man. Like, it's just been a pleasure. Yeah. I'm sure your okay, students that. will love your new course. Yeah, I thought it was great to be honest, and the lectures are great. The the, the podcasts are great online. Um, just literally, I mean, I don't want to sort of pander to you too much, Lloyd, but the videos are great. <laughs> They're really concise and clear. Um, yeah, I think it's, just, it's good stuff. <laughs> thank you, Rob. Appreciate that. Yeah. Great. Okay. So thank you very much for listening. And I am Laura. My co-host is Aaron Marsh. And uh, thank you to Rob for those wonderful questions. And thank you to Lloyd for answering them. Take care. Bye. Cheers, Lloyd.